We all go through different chapters in our lives, some stranger than others. Welcome to Strange Chapters, where we bring you true stories of the strange, the macabre, the paranormal, and the supernatural. So sit back, relax, and let's get to this week's featured author and their stories. Hey everybody, welcome back to Strange Chapters. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of the show, and thank you so much for listening. This week we have three stories from author Adrian Finney's Strange Britain series, and the book is titled Strange Manchester, Ghost Stories, UFO Encounters, and Other Strange Tales. Adrian Finney's books are available on Amazon, Kindle, and wherever fine books are sold, and you can get those links down in the show notes as usual. So, if you're ready to head across a pond, sit back, relax. And let's get strange. The Ghost of Manchester Airport Manchester Airport is the third busiest airport in the country, the busiest outside of London, and offers direct flights around 200 destinations all across the world. Its origins lay in a small airfield called Ringway, named for the village it was in, which opened in 1938. In 1939, with the outbreak of World War II, the RAF took over operations and the airfield was renamed RAF Ringway. It was initially used as a pilot training school, and later in the war, it also housed the RAF's number one parachute training school. Over 80,000 troops came to Manchester for their parachute training. Along with the troops, agents of the Special Operations Executive, SOE, also trained at RAF Ringway, and if that name is familiar to you, it might be because it is the direct precursor to MI6. SOE agents were often trained in sabotage techniques and then parachuted behind enemy lines with the intention that their training would help them scupper Germany's war effort. Aircraft company Avro had a factory on the site where almost 5,000 planes were built during the duration of the war. Avro also had a developmental hangar where the Avro Manchester bomber was developed. That aircraft became the basis for the design of the much more famous Lancaster bomber. After the war, the site was still used as an RAF flight school before closing its hangars in 1957 when it was handed back to civilian control. It began regular civilian passenger flights in 1946 when a direct scheduled flight to France became available. In 2021, Air France celebrated 75 years of continual operation from Manchester Airport. The Manchester-Paris flight route is the oldest continually operated route in the world. The last surviving World War II hangars were demolished in the late 1990s to make way for the construction of Terminal 3. In the early 1970s, Manchester Airport, along with the entire airline industry, was experiencing a boom. The airport expanded rapidly and began offering flights direct to North America and the Far East. Passenger numbers grew massively year on year. In 1971, a spooky sighting was made. It was the middle of the night, and security guards spotted what looked to be a man in an RAF flight suit, looking dazed and confused, wandering around the departure gate. As they approached the man, they saw he looked absolutely terrified. Wondering what could have happened to scare the man so, and where it was he could have come from in the first place, the guards moved in to intercept him. It was then he faded away, over the course of about 10 seconds, going from appearing as solid and real as the building around him, to becoming semi-transparent, to fading away to nothingness. The security guards were confused, but more so than that, they were worried about the man and why he had such a look of fear on his face. They felt he needed their help, and they felt powerless that they couldn't give it. They searched the area, but they knew they wouldn't be able to find the man. A few nights later, he was back again, this time in the service corridors, again looking very confused. This time, the security guards managed to get a much better look at him before his repeated disappearance. He was wearing the very distinctive suit of a World War II era parachutist. This led the men to research the history of the airport, and they concluded that he must have been one of the many pilots sent to train at RAF Ringway, and that he was one of a handful of pilots who had died there due to either parachute malfunction or misuse. In the 50 years since the original sighting, the Phantom Parachutist has been seen hundreds of times more. There's even a persistent rumor that when Terminal 1 was heavily redeveloped and expanded, an executive decision was made to move the departure gates. This was done to ensure that the area where the Parachutist was repeatedly appearing would be kept as a dead space in the building so as not to alarm any employees or passengers. The most recent sighting of the man, stood looking as lost and confused as he had way back in 1971, happened in 2017. A cleaner was in the supply stores when he saw a man walk past the open door. Knowing that he should have been alone in that part of the terminal, the cleaner went to confront the man. This time, however, he did not fade away, 
Instead, he walked straight through a solid, locked door. The cleaner quietly reported this to his boss, who smiled and said, Oh, you've met him then. As far as we know, the ghostly parachutist is still there to this day. Terminal 1 isn't the only part of Manchester Airport that's home to paranormal activity. Terminal 3 also has a ghost of its own. Pilots have often seen a fellow pilot walk through the lounge looking in distress. The figure always walks into the men's toilets. Over the years, other pilots have followed him in, wanting to help their seemingly distressed colleague, only to find the toilets empty. The same toilets have also been prone to poltergeist activity over the years. The stalls would often shake violently, doors would bang, and the taps would be turned off and on. Terminal 3, where the sightings of the ghost pilot are centered, was built on the side of the hangars that housed the earliest civilian flights out of Manchester. Could one of these early planes have crashed back in the 1940s, leaving the ghost of the pilot forever trapped in the airport? We just don't know. Records from the pre-jet engine era are hard to come by. Next time you're taking a flight out of Manchester Airport, you'll best keep your eyes open as you never know what you might encounter. It could be a stag do on their way to Benidorm, catching an early morning flight, or you could catch a glimpse of the ghost of a long-dead parachutist. The Floating Eyes of Platte Lane First reported in the 1980s, those walking along Platte Lane, just outside of Lee, are sometimes met with the oddest of sights. Multiple reports came in that dozens and dozens of pairs of floating eyes were seen staring out from either side of the road. The eyes were set to instill a huge sense of sadness, loss, and grief in all those who had witnessed them. No other human feature, aside from the eyes, could be seen. The history of the area gives us a possible source for all these sad pairs of eyes, the Pretoria Pit Disaster. The Holden Colliery Company was once a massive employer back when the area surrounding Lee, Wigan, and Bolton was considered part of Lancashire. It had its origins back in 1571 when a number of small coal miners were set up as part of the larger Holton estate. By the early 19th century, the mines had become one of the major employers in the region and colliery owner William Hutton, who was also the high sheriff of Lancashire, had become very wealthy indeed. This is despite, or perhaps because of, his opposition to workers' rights and him paying his miners the lowest wages in the whole of England. He knew his workers were too poor to move, so they had to accept any terms he gave them, no matter how bad. Throughout the 19th and early 20th century, the pits expanded, seeking even deeper. With further pits being added, and the tunnels were spreading out even further, coal from the area was helping fuel the Industrial Revolution. In 1897, Holton Colliery's bank pits, number one and two, were sunk, followed quickly by bank pits three and four in 1901. This was mining being carried out on a hitherto unimaginable scale. The four pits were directly responsible for employing over 2,400 men and boys. The workers also kept plenty of other industries in the town and business. The number three pit was known locally as the Pretoria Pit, and it was working five full coal seams, the Trench and Bone, the Plotter, Yard, Three Quarters, and Arley Mines. The mines were all accessed for the main number three shaft. Wednesday, 21st December 1910, began as a normal working morning. The men clocked on at 7 a.m. and descended down into the pit. Then, at 7.50 a.m., tragedy struck. An explosion rocked the plotter mine, causing massive damage to the mine shaft, resulting in the collapse. It is now believed to have been caused by an accumulation of gas that had been building up following a partial roof collapse the previous day. Of all the miners who went down that morning, only four made it back to the surface. And two of the four who made it out alive died shortly afterward from their injuries. In addition, two men died in the surrounding mines due to additional collapses brought about by the explosion. In total, 344 people had lost their lives, and it became the second worst mining accident in English history. The people in the surrounding towns have felt the explosion shake their homes like an earthquake. They lived around mining long enough to know exactly what that shaking meant, disaster. Within 10 minutes of the explosion, dozens of word relatives began arriving at the colliery gates. Colliery miner, Alfred Tong, led a rescue mission, but sadly it was too late. The vast majority of the miners had died of asphyxiation. The flash explosion had quickly burned up the mine's limited oxygen, leaving those not initially killed to suffocate. Those sent down into the mine as part of the rescue effort, which quickly became a matter of body recovery, said it was the most eerie and unsettling sight. Dozens and dozens of pairs of lifeless eyes staring at them, unblinking and unmoving. Perhaps it's the eyes of these miners that are still looking out on the area directly above the deaths to this day, forever trapped at the sight of their tragic end. Looking out in eternal sadness. The Cursed Skull of Wardley Hall 
There's been a building on the site of Salford's Wardley Hall since at least the year 1292. The current hall dates predominantly to around the year 1500, although it was extensively renovated and restored in 1894. Wardley Hall is currently the official residence for the Roman Catholic Bishop of Salford. It also played a key role in the life and death of Ambrose Barlow. He was a Roman Catholic priest who, in 1641, found himself in a very difficult spot. King Charles I had just signed a decree outlawing Catholicism and giving all practicing priests just one month to leave the country or face arrest and trial for treason. At this point in his life, Ambrose was 56 years old and a very ill man, having recently suffered a stroke, but he also was a proud Catholic and refused to flee. On 10th April 1641, which happened to be Easter Sunday, Ambrose was leading his congregation of around 150 at Morley's Hall in Ashley in what was an illegal mass. The vicar of Lee, a man of the Church of England faith, had heard rumblings of the Catholic gathering and marched his well-armed congregation of almost 500 to arrest them. If you think of a rowdy mob armed with pitchforks, you wouldn't be far wrong. Father Ambrose, fearing the worst for his congregation, offered the vicar a deal. They could arrest him and he would happily stand trial for treason if, and only if, they let his congregation go unpunished. The vicar quickly agreed to these terms and Father Ambrose was placed in custody and taken to Lancaster Castle. On September 8, 1641, Father Ambrose was found guilty of treason and just two days later, he was executed. He was hung, drawn, and quartered. After that, his remains were then boiled in oil. His head was placed outside on a pike. A few days later, an ear-piercing screech began coming from the head. No matter how much they tried, the guards could not make it stop. One of the guards, secretly a Catholic, spirited the skull away and passed it to fellow loyal Catholic Francis Downs, the Lord of Wardley Hall, who was also Father Ambrose's cousin. Wardley Hall was where both Francis Downs and Ambrose Barlow had grown up, and as children, the two were more like brothers than cousins. It was only once the skull crossed the property line and entered Wardley Hall, passing into the care of Francis Downs, that the screeching stopped. The skull, it would appear, was home. In the centuries that followed, the skull was stolen several times, and each time the skull was removed from the grounds of Wardley Hall, the screeching began again. This ensured that the skull was always swiftly returned. The skull, it would appear, was cursed. It was Francis Downs who, upon the coronation of King Charles II, an event which also heralded the return of religious freedom to England, gifted Worley Hall to his beloved Catholic Church. To this day, it is still the official residence of the standing Bishop of Salford. On the 25th of October 1970, Pope Paul IV canonized Father Ambrose, thus making him St. Ambrose. St. Ambrose's skull is still bricked up in an alcove in one of the stairwells of Worley Hall. To remove it, it is said to trigger the curse and the skull screech. It isn't the only part of Father Ambrose to survive. His jawbone is in the church of St. Ambrose of Milan in the Barlow Moor area of Manchester. He has one hand in Stanbrook Abbey in North Yorkshire, whilst the other hand somehow managed to make it across the Atlantic. It's currently located inside Mount Angel Abbey in Oregon. All right, everybody, that is it for this week's stories. These stories were from author Adrian Finney's series, Strange Britain. This book is titled Strange Manchester, Ghost Stories, UFO Encounters, and Other Strange Tales. You can find all Adrian Finney's books on Amazon, Kindle, and wherever fine books are sold. And you can find that info in the show notes. So until next time, stay safe out there and stay strange.